At its best, rail transit is fast, frequent, and reliable. I'm talking about high capacity trains, completely grade separated, either underground or elevated. But in the US, we're still building low capacity rail, small vehicles that run in mixed traffic with operating characteristics not much different from a typical bus. So today we're gonna to ask the question of why we're still building and operating new streetcar lines and how older historic streetcars and trams that are still operating can help us answer the question. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer suggested topics, always welcome down in the comments, and this one wasn't really. I mean, I do get things like do a top 10 list of streetcar systems that have the highest ridership, but even I'm kind of who cares on that one. Instead, this is one where I just want to ask why. Why are we still building modern streetcars and is it justifiable to build expensive new transit infrastructure whose main goal seems to be something other than moving large numbers of people quickly, reliably, and efficiently? Or put more simply, is it okay to build public transportation where the main purpose is something other than transportation. So what I'm talking about today is streetcars, and they might be called trams in other countries, but the definitions do get squishy, so let's just take a minute to define terms, because I really want to differentiate what I'm talking about from light rail. You can have pretty good light rail that operates in a dedicated lane, has signal priority, and even has completely grade-separated segments. But you can also have light rail that has sections that operate in mixed traffic, so it's a spectrum. But this is a US-based channel, so I'm just going to go with the definitions as laid out by the Federal Transit Administration. The FTA says that light rail is typically an electric railway with light volume traffic capacity compared to heavy rail, and the vehicles typically operate in exclusive rights of way. What they categorize as streetcar rail, on the other hand, operates predominantly in mixed traffic, typically with single car trains and frequent stops. These are the terms and definitions they use in the mode field of the National Transit Database. And you know what? I lied. Here are the top 10 streetcar systems in the US by ridership. See, I'm just giving it to you on one screen instead of wasting 15 minutes of your time carrying on insufferably the way I normally would. The one thing I do want to point out here though is that this is a mix of legacy streetcars where the routes and some of the infrastructure date from before the advent of the automobile and modern streetcars that have been completely constructed from the ground up in the last 25 years or so. And I want to talk a bit about the number one performing modern streetcar system, and really the one that kicked off the current renaissance for better or worse, and that's the Portland streetcar. First, let's recognize that nobody ever intended for the Portland streetcar to be considered high capacity transit. It's more accurate to think of it as a piece of urban design meant to help catalyze a couple of very large, what we call opportunity sites. Brownfields, essentially. The River District on the north of downtown and the South Waterfront. I don't really talk about urban design on this channel. It's not my wheelhouse, but it was part of my grad school curriculum and I have worked on a lot of projects that have an urban design element in it, so I'm kind of familiar with the language. So let's do a quick primer, and the resource I would use for this is Kevin Lynch's The Image of the City, which dates from 1960, but a lot of the concepts are still core urban design principles today. Like the idea that identifiable, successful urban districts have particular design elements, landmarks or points of reference, nodes or focal points, edges or boundaries like streets, overpasses, and shorelines, and paths, which are highly legible channels within which people travel that really help arrange and rationalize the space. And I think you'd argue that an urban streetcar is this kind of urban design element. How important is good urban design to a city? Well, that's kind of hard to quantify, to put it mildly. Here's how the city's consultant characterized the streetcar's importance as a development catalyst. 
First, they noted that properties closest to the streetcar alignment had development intensity, meaning floor area ratios, that were much closer to the property's zoned density potential than properties situated further away. They also noted that prior to 1997, land located within one block of the eventual alignment captured just 19% of all central city development, but that after the alignment was identified, Land within a block of it was responsible for 55% of all new development within the CBD. The result, over time, is billions in new development, thousands of new housing units in the central, transit-rich areas where you want them, probably more of them actually targeted for lower-income folks than you might be thinking. So what did it cost to build a streetcar line that connects these two huge opportunity sites? through downtown and all the way into the Northwest District, about a hundred million dollars. And that's a lot of money that you might argue could have been spent on more bus service or any number of other investments that would have done more to improve Portland's transit system. But could you have, really? It's probably worth doing a whole video on how something like this gets financed, but 70% of the funding came from three location-specific sources parking fee increases in city-owned parking garages that are mostly within a quarter mile or so of the streetcar route, tax increment financing from the new development, mostly within these huge opportunity sites, and local improvement district contributions, again, along the streetcar route itself. So you can see how, if you're an elected official, something like the Portland streetcar seems like a bargain. It mostly gets paid for by fees generated along the alignment that you figure you wouldn't get otherwise if you didn't build the streetcar. And it's hard to say if that's right or wrong, but you certainly can see the logic of why they built it. The idea here is that we need more housing density in our in-demand cities and development responds to walkable environments that have visible transit connections and well thought out urban design. The city determined that the streetcar was an important part of that and it is an example of a transit project, arguably successful, whose main objective was something other than moving people quickly and efficiently. And on that note, I am back in the US now, but let's turn back the clock and go back to Lisbon, Portugal, where I was for the last two weeks. It is similar to Porto in terms of urban fabric and architectural style, but I'm not going to complain about it the way I complained about Porto. Lisbon is a noticeably bigger city and it seems better able to absorb the ravenous demands of tourism without it feeling like it's ruining the city. Also, like Porto, when it comes to transportation, the topography can be pretty daunting, so it's got funiculars. And it has telepharicos, although this one's at the zoo. I don't know, just not the highest capacity transit mode, however you do it. Lisbon does have pretty good intercity train service, which you are likely to use if you come to visit because there are great day trips you can take out of Cais de Sodro Station to Cascais, I still can't pronounce Portuguese, where it's very pedestrian friendly. They have great beaches and a beachfront promenade. And if the mood strikes, you can spend some time learning about the marvels of seaweed. Or out of Rocio Station, you can catch a train to Sintra, which, well, words kind of fail. You really have to see it for yourself. And yes, Lisbon does have a legit, fully grade-separated metro, which is kind of a godsend because the traffic on the streets is pretty uniformly miserable. And it does have, well, I don't know if you want to call it light rail or a modern streetcar, but let's be honest, you don't come to Lisbon to ride vehicles you could ride in Portland or Kansas City or Cincinnati. You come here for something different, something with a little more character. You come here for trams, and more specifically, Tram 28. You might have noticed that whoever decorated my Airbnb just went way over the top on the Tram 28 stuff. And trust me, my A-roll backdrop was only a small sampling of the madness. But you can understand it. I hate to overuse the word, but it is iconic. 
the sight and the sound of it is inextricable from your experience of certain Lisbon neighborhoods. It's great scenery, like obviously I couldn't stop photographing it. And if you go at the right time, riding it is a pretty solid tourist experience, which I'm just gonna choose not to hate on tourism today because it's dumb and I personally did enjoy my 14 days of tourism in this city. But I have to say, I could never seem to identify anyone on any of these trams that looked like a local. Like, I just assume that if you live here, you avoid tram 28, like the plague. I mean, just the lines at Martin Moniz station. I guess this is the official beginning of the route, which is a loop, so the huge queue just seems a bit weird since you can get on the tram just about anywhere else along the route. But given the lines of tourists and the frequency the trams sometimes run at to keep up with demand, I have to think that this is a moneymaker for the city, just on Fairbox, let alone all the great marketing they get from how darn photogenic the thing is. Pretty much the whole route is undeniably scenic with narrow streets that, if you're a pedestrian, you better be listening behind you because Tram 28 will clip you if you aren't paying attention. The thing is though, and this is probably what makes the trams such an attraction for visitors, they're very cool, but they just aren't really replicable at all. You couldn't create a transit line like this from whole cloth. Its design is very specific to its environment, and it's really layered in a pattern of history and place. And look, I know these things run in mixed traffic, but don't try to tell me they aren't awesome. In fact, if you're a transit purist, you might want to avert your eyes for this next part because I definitely rode this beauty. I was gonna say the trams here aren't really for transportation at this point, but maybe? I avoided it for most of my stay because riding it looked annoying, but it was late. My Airbnb was at a high elevation and climbing up all those hills after what was already a long day of walking after a couple of adult beverages at lower elevation, well, that just wasn't happening. So now I'm just gonna back off and let you enjoy the Tram 28 ASMR. Okay, in a minute I'm going to talk about some of the issues with the historic trams in Lisbon. But first, brief reminder to drop a like on the video and subscribe if you're a huge fan of light rail that operates in mixed traffic and really, who isn't? Connect on various websites if once a week just isn't enough of my sparkling personality. And if you choose to support directly on Patreon, you'll get access to a modest catalog of bonus content, but mostly you'll just feel better about yourself as a human being. So if you go at night or you get lucky with traffic, the tram can be pretty zippy to the point where if you get the right driver, you can pull some G's going around curves. But more often than not, the trams are stuck in the same congestion as everyone else. And it is Lisbon, so we're talking about just an ungodly number of these tuk-tuks, which are often in sightseeing mode. They're not trying to get from point A to point B at the legal maximum speed the way a taxi would. Instead, they're slowing down so the driver can call out points of interest or restaurants they're getting kickbacks from or whatever. These are mostly pretty narrow streets with a lot of competing demands, although the city does what it can to accommodate everyone in the few places on the network where the roads do widen out. But mostly the streets are really narrow, sometimes to the point where the alignment gets reduced to a single track, which means the signals at either end of the constrained segment, which, yeah, that will slow things down. And here's the main point. It is a train, it travels on rails. If a driver parallel parks their car 
incompetently. The tram has to wait for the car to move. If there's a fender bender and the drivers decide to spend half an hour arguing about it instead of moving their cars, the tram isn't going anywhere. Or if a vehicle just stalls on the tracks, everybody on the tram is just gonna have to wait until the driver of the vehicle like rummages through the glove box for the manual and attempts to troubleshoot on whatever timeline they're comfortable with. No rush. So look, trams are cool. The tracks add character to the street. The yellow of the carriages really pops. And if we want to convince ourselves that they're a profitable tourism draw or a development catalyst, that's fine. But when it comes to transportation, let's not pretend it's anything more than a less flexible version of a bus. Okay, that is all I got. I'm just gonna roll the credits and play you out with some bonus tram ASMR. So thanks for joining and I will see you next week. Thank you.